Okay, good afternoon everyone uh, and it's great to see people at a, a really important session on data and impact. The other select few uh, in an enormous hall but we have a great session for you. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Garner uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and I just want to say a few uh, opening words about this session. I, I think everybody knows the treatment cascade and what a powerful tool it's been. Uh, and we wanted to talk about the, both the treatment cascade but also uh, prevention cascades. At the Durban AIDS conference, there was a session on HIV prevention cascades, which was very theoretical. And what we're hoping from this session is that there will be many more examples of actually putting data into those cascades so that we can see how well, well they're doing. I, I think uh, cascades are a powerful tool because they measure that pathway from our inputs to uh, an impact. We can use them to identify gaps in our programs and then we can try and identify interventions to, to fill those gaps. There is though, I think, a real challenge with these cascades is that, that we, they, they can get very complicated and difficult and we do need to try and work out how to make them simple and useful as tools. And I'm sure our speakers will show us good examples of prevention cascades and where the thinking uh, is going uh, within those. So without further ado, I'll hand over to my co-chair, Susan uh, Bookbinder, uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much and welcome to the session. Um, I will without further ado, introduce our first speaker, Dr. James Hargraves, who's a professor in epidemiology and evaluation at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he directs the Center for Evaluation as well as the MESH Consortium. Great, thanks very much, Susan. Um, Right, um, I, uh, as Susan says, I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, where I lead the MeSH Consortium with my colleague Brian Rice, with whom I prepared this presentation. And I've been given the task of kind of setting the scene around constructing and using cascades for HIV treatment and prevention, and I'm going to concentrate a little more on the prevention side. I'm going to start by telling you the overall messages of the talk. So, so the treatment cascade, as Jeff just said, has been an incredibly powerful and galvanizing framework. Um, I've spent the whole week going around and seeing cascades, and it's really created energy. The treatment cascade is not without problems, both in measurement and in thinking about how to respond to gaps when you see them. And uh, in our role in the MeSH Consortium, one of the key things that we're interested in is uh, making the case for strengthened investment in routine HIV data systems to drive that action that cascades um, give rise to or lead you to want to, to perform. So I'm going to talk briefly about the treatment cascade and then I'm going to talk about the prevention cascade and I'm going to try and make, highlight similarities rather than differences between the prevention cascade which I think can also be a powerful framework. Um, there are obvious many, many differences and complexities with the ideas of treatment, cascade, uh, treatment and prevention cascades um, but I'm going to try and make the case that we should think of the similarities too and take on some of the measurement challenges that prevention cascades suggest. So the treatment cascade, here's a treatment cascade. I could have, as I say, produced many uh, from the recently. This is from the, the FIA in Malawi. So this is an example of a cascade drawn from a nationally representative sample. And it has the familiar, kind of the, the leanest of the cascade forms uh, showing the proportion of people living with HIV who are diagnosed on treatment and virally suppressed. This will not be news to anyone. And in this paper from Wolfgang Sladek a couple of years ago, and this is actually an excerpt from a figure in his, this is just again one of many uh, pictures I could show you, where he try shows that on this slightly extended uh, set of cascade steps, um, the key thing is that those gaps from one bar to the next lead you to think about programmatic action to fill those gaps. And so identifying where those gaps are can then lead to further inquiry and help you think about what sorts of interventions would be useful to fill them. Wolfgang's paper also talks about two um, extreme, if you like, two ends of how people go about um, drawing these cascades. I showed you one already from a, a national survey, and that's one way of getting at cascade data, is population-based surveys. Um, these are obviously, their scope is defined by um, the, ge the sampling area that you use. It can be a country or it can be a smaller um, area. They can only really be done periodically, such big endeavors, and there are strengths and weaknesses to the way in which um, that you can do these cascades. Um, they obviously can cost quite a lot of money. They can only be done periodically, but they have many advantages as well. 
In many parts of the world, cascades aren't drawn from nationally representative surveys, and principally in many parts of the world, what's drawn on is case reporting data and service facility data. So this is counting people who access those different steps of the uh, uh, services along the cascade, and then using various other pieces of information to identify the steps along the cascade um, and the, the proportions of people um, reached at eCase. Uh, and this, of course, also has problems. Um, routine data in clinics uh, can often be frail and, and need careful attention to quality. Um, but there are many advantages. These, this is where you know, locally driven cascades can drive local action, and we feel like we should be striving towards um, that end to, to complement the national surveys. In, in practice, many countries at the moment are doing somewhere, somewhere in between, and I've, I've, I haven't shown which country this is, but this is an example from a, a workshop done in, uh, that WHO supported with MESH uh, a couple of years ago, and this is an example from a country trying to draw a cascade their denominator here, the number of estimated number of people living with HIV, was drawn from Spectrum, um, um, the modelling tool that UNAIDS used. They didn't feel at the time that they had good data on the number of people who are aware or diagnosed with their status. And then the two numerators were coming from programmatic data. They, they, they did have registers that told them how many people had accessed care and how many people are on ART. And then finally, they had a survey from a couple of years previously that had estimated the proportion of people in ART who are virally suppressed. And it was this kind of hybrid approach which was used to draw the cascade at that time. And, and that kind of highlights that we both need to think about the frailties in both the survey approaches and the models and the, the clinic data. Okay, so that's treatment cascades will be absolutely nothing new to you. I'm going to show you now a short film about a prevention cascade, and hopefully you'll get some audio. Hopefully. A new framework called the HIV Prevention Cascade enables us to use everything we know about HIV to help us tackle the virus. We've tended to group HIV risk and interventions in three categories, biomedical, behavioral, and structural. This way of thinking has been helpful, but it does have problems. We may put all our faith in a biomedical technology such as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP without recognizing that we need to support PrEP use. Or we may be over-optimistic about the impact on HIV of improving gender equality if it is not integrated with other preventive steps. In fact, we need to integrate biomedical, behavioral, and structural responses to HIV. And the prevention cascade helps us to do this. Let's consider an example a priority population facing high risk of HIV infection, adolescent girls and young women in sub-Saharan Africa. In principle, a young woman can choose from and combine a number of direct mechanisms of HIV prevention to protect herself against HIV infection. She could use condoms consistently or take PrEP every day or decide not to be sexually active. Different options might suit her at different times in her life but her choices are likely to be constrained. Let's look at one possible prevention option. A significant number of sexually active young women are not using condoms or not using them reliably. They would benefit from taking PrEP to protect themselves. What is needed to achieve high levels of effective use of PrEP among this group? Out of the total, only a certain number will be motivated to use PrEP as a prevention mechanism. Why is that? A young woman may not know about PrEP or may not understand her own risk of HIV or may be constrained by social norms that inhibit women's sexual activity and agency. To increase the number of young women motivated to use PrEP, we need to design new programs or add new and effective elements into existing programs for instance, in sexual and reproductive health. These elements might include peer-led or clinic-based information and awareness programs or interventions to shift social norms around PrEP use. Schools, media, integrated health services, and the community could deliver these interventions and policies will be needed to support high coverage, intensity, and quality of the interventions. Next, we ask, who lacks access to PrEP. Some young women who are motivated to use PrEP may not be able to access it because PrEP is not available or not easily accessible or not affordable 
or because there's stigma present in the places where PrEP can be accessed. To close the access gap, we could intervene to ensure that health services where PrEP is accessed are convenient, free and youth friendly. We could deliver these interventions across the range of places where PrEP might be accessed. To support these interventions, policies would need to establish budgets to provide, for example, antiretrovirals, support, health worker training and social welfare. Finally, some young women in this population may be motivated to take PrEP and have access to PrEP but still not be able to take PrEP consistently and effectively over time. Daily adherence may be difficult for a young woman because, for example, her parents or a partner may not approve or her living situation may be insecure or her partner may be violent and or abusing alcohol or stigma around HIV medication may discourage her. How could we strengthen young women's capacity to adhere over time? Programs could include long-term counseling services, economic or gender-based empowerment, and social protection. The health development and welfare sectors, such as the government and the NGOs, offer potential platforms with policies needed to ensure such interventions are in place. In this way, the Prevention Cascade offers a framework for identifying gaps in HIV prevention and for planning interventions to close those gaps. Right, so that, so that cartoon has hopefully been quite useful in giving you the general idea of the Prevention Cascade as it was laid out in the, the papers presented in, uh, a couple of years ago in Durban. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of Prevention Cascades very quickly, but they're both stolen slides from a session that's immediately after this one uh, in Elysium 1. Um, the first one's from Sharon Weir's work, and she'll present this in more detail, uh, as I say, in that session. This is a prevention cascade that relates to condoms um, using data from place surveys in Angola, and it outlines those steps, um, as, I, uh, as shown in the, the video, of availability, use, and then consistent use of condoms amongst sex workers. And here's another example of uh, data from female sex workers. These are from Zimbabwe. Um, this paper will also be presented in that next session. This is an interesting example because it's trying to combine two different uh, approaches to HIV prevention. On the left-hand side are levels of demand, access, and then adherence to condoms amongst these women. And then coming in from the right side, this was in the context also of a demonstration project for PrEP, and there's uh, information about demand, access, and adherence to PrEP, and in the middle are women covered by one or both of those mechanisms. Um, in the papers in the Lancet series a couple of years ago, um, we, we did a lot of work trying to link this uh, cascade framework to potential programmatic actions. Um, and so in the similar way um, as for the treatment cascade, by understanding what the gaps are, the next obvious question is what interventions are available to fill those gaps. And this figure um, gives, the sen you know, gives an idea, as, as in the, the video, of what targets you would be trying to get at with an intervention given a particular gap what interventions may be available, and then what platforms you might deliver them to, re to reach the population you need to get at, and how policies um, could support that. Uh, and we also did a systematic review of reviews of the entire prevention literature and organized prevention interventions in relation to this framework and where they, uh, which parts of this framework they addressed. Obviously, many programs will hit more than one of these cascades. There are many, many challenges in taking the idea of a prevention cascade forward. Um, these are challenging concepts to measure. Um, treatment and prevention are very different, one reason being that there are many prevention options for people. Um, w people have very large de degrees of heterogeneity in their risk, and that changes over time. And the prevention cascade isn't a true cascade in the sense that every step is conditional uh, on the next. But I guess our overarching message, and this is my final slide, is just to return to that, is that the treatment cascade has been very powerful. It's not easy to measure, certainly not at country level, and certainly not always in a way that can guide action. We would like to believe that the prevention cascade can also be helpful in the same way. There are differences, but there are similarities in the underlying ideas behind this. And taking on these measurement and programming challenges has been a, a theme of the conference so far, and we think that should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Don't, don't run away yet. So, so we do have a, f a few minutes for questions, if anybody has questions for James. Please. Uh, George Rutherford from the University of California, San Francisco in the U.S. Uh, we've gone back and forth about prevention cascades over the last couple of years. What time limit would you put on this? Is this meant to be lifelong cascade or at the end of a year? Or what, at what point would you measure your final outcome? 
At what point would you measure the final outcome? Yeah. At what point do you stop drawing boxes? Yeah, I mean, so, so I think like for the treatment cascade, you can conceive of this uh, both in a snapshot cross-sectional way, which is the most common approach. Both of the cascades I showed are of that form, and that's the most common form the treatment cascade um, relates to. You have to be talking, of course, about effective use within a defined time period, and that's usually retrospective in the same way that reported adherence would be for treatment. The idea of a longitudinal cascade, I think, is another one that's complex for the treatment cascade. Um, lots of sessions I've been in have been highlighting the importance of thinking about cascades as continuums and longitudinally. I haven't thought about it, George, exactly how you would do that for the prevention cascade, but I don't think the principles would be very different if you can get the measurement of the concepts right. Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. Thank you. That was a lovely talk. Um, I don't know whether you have already answered my question. I was going to say, do we need to take into account the amount of time X number of people spend in each step of the cascade? For both of the cascades, I think it would uh, apply. I don't know whether that's what you meant by the longitudinal cascade or whether you were talking about an aggregate longitudinalness and step-by-step step would be different. But I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the temporal dimension. Yeah, so I think my answer is going to be quite similar to the previous one in, in that I don't know. So, so for the treatment cascade, one can think about snapshots and one can think about the journey of a particular person and when they're, the rate at which they're diagnosed, they enter care, and then achieve suppression. Now, obviously, that's, that's also complicated because those things ebb and flow. People go in and out of care and they're viral. So there, you know, that, that longitudinal way, I think, is particularly important. You see lots of uh, stuff at the conference uh, about the importance of getting younger people, for example, diagnosed. And at least, of course, partly that, when you look at cross-sectional cascades, is because they've usually been uh, infected for less time. And there is a, you know, there's a survival issue there, a cohort issue. So again, for the prevention cascade, I think you, you know, we have to be thinking about the same kind of idea. People, and an additional complexity is that people go into and out of different phases of risk. Um, so um, those would be challenging measurement issues to take on. But I think the principle is the same. You could, you, you know, people go into and out of periods of, and, and with different prevention options, they go into and out of different periods where they might have access or not, or be motivated to take a prevention, particular prevention option or not, or adhere to it or, or not. So. I, I think both that you can, you can think of a snapshot way of presenting the cascade or you can think of it in a cohort sense. Okay, thank you, James. So, so perhaps we can come back to this issue of duration when we come to the panel discussion at the end. Sure. Be great. Thank you very much for that, that presentation. So, So our next presenter is uh, Celestine Mugambi, who is currently the head of technical support, uh, the technical support division at the National AIDS Control Council in Kenya, where she's the technical lead for HIV prevention, adolescents, and young people programming. And we're looking forward to hearing how these cascades are used within a particular country. Celestine. So good afternoon. I don't have a video like James, but I'm proudly Kenyan and I am Team Kenya. And I want to welcome you for our session, satellite session tomorrow at 7 a.m. on PrEP, which is one of the prevention interventions. I want to start, or rather give you perspectives from the front line and perspectives from Kenya on what we think about the prevention cascades and how we see they can be potentially beneficial at country level. So this is just the context of Kenya or HIV burden, and I really want to focus on the new infections, which were at 52,800 as of 2017. And if you look at the adolescents and young people between the ages of 15 and 24, the new infections were at 17,700. When you look at our HIV infection trends, um, the blue line is our current path, and the red dotted line is where we're supposed to be by 2020 which is less than 25,000 infections. So if you really look at prevention in Kenya, you really need to scale it up and to fast track the interventions that we are doing. So I want to focus a bit on, on the already working treatment cascades in Kenya and to focus on the 1990 uh, cascade, which really has been a rallying tool, has 
coalesced everybody around getting people tested, put on treatment, and virally suppressed. If you look at our 1990-90 cascade for treatment, we're at 82% for the first 90, 75% for the second 90, and 63% for the third 90. When you look at our EMTCT cascade again, which is both uh, treatment and prevention cascade, this is how we are doing in terms of our achievement, the need for PMTCT, those who are positive prophylaxis, infant prophylaxis, and skill delivery. Now, this particular cascade back in Kenya has gathered a lot of high-level political advocacy, and that really is the potential for cascades, even as we think about prevention. We have used this cascade for resource mobilization. There has been ownership and accountability, both at sub-national level, at service delivery level, and even at the community level. So the, the, um, the prospects and the potential for cascades is enormous. When we talk about HIV prevention, what are the issues that, that we see? And with prevention programs specifically, we have lack of leadership investments and accountability. There's reluctance to address sensitive issues around HIV prevention, like condoms, which directly will be touching on sex and sexuality. And then we've had lack of systematic implementation of prevention uh, programs. We've, have, we've had uh, pilot programs happening in specific areas, but nothing really to scale. And there's also there's been a very big reluctance to leverage on the non-health sec systems and sectors. And I dare say, if we're going to talk about prevention cascades, we have to tap into the other sectors. But the biggest problem is the ones size fits all approach. Different people div they need different interventions. So what have we have been doing has been a one size fits all approach. Now why do we think we need prevention cascades? They're going to help us set standard targets to work towards and allow identification of policy strategy and program gaps. And really a very big one for us is to interest the policy makers and to revitalize and to revamp prevention. Most importantly, also to spur technical action and accountability at service delivery level. What the EMCT cascade has done for us back in Kenya is that it has created ownership, like I'd said, so everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing at service delivery level, and we're actually able to track each and every aspect of the cascade. So the same can also happen with prevention cascades, and also use the cascades as a, an advocacy tool and also to mobilize for resources for the prevention interventions. And what opportunities do we have? We have an, a great opportunity as we speak. The Global Prevention Roadmap, the 10-point action plan, which has standard targets and outputs, has prioritized uh, populations and interventions and within the local context, and then also has got very high political commitment uh, globally and also at, at country level. So which cascades should we invest in? So we can either go population-based cascades and ask ourselves who is at risk, where are they, and look at the different populations. Like I said, different populations different, need different things, and most importantly, which ones do we prioritize and where do we implement our cascades? We could also go the intervention-based uh, cascade way and look at what intervention is required by who, what specific uh, intervention cascades, or are we going to do intervention-specific cascades or package-based cascades, have a layer of interventions. We also need to look at targets, what are the available data systems, and accountability for monitoring and reporting. So I wanted to highlight um, one potential cascade, rather two. So this is a map of, of Kenya looking at adolescents and young people and the new HIV infections as of 2017. And I want to direct you to the map on your right, really showing where we are having more than 1,000 new infections between the ages of 15 and 24. So potentially all these young people would need some sort of prevention intervention. But the thing we need to ask ourselves is, how do we characterize those who are most at risk? Because not everybody in this context needs prevention interventions. Then also, we need to look at the local epidemics. My country is divided into 47 counties. Each county epidemic is different from the other. How then do we do have effective cascades to reach those who are most at need at um, the individual counties? So this is my theoretical population-based cascade. If we were to do an algorithm of identifying the most at-risk young girl, probably need to do a size estimation of those who are between the ages of 10 to 24, and then estimate the population most at risk using risk of vulnerability profiling, uh, data at community level and from health facilities. Then look at the program coverage of the most at-risk adolescent, and then provide interventions and monitor those ones who are remaining HIV 
negative. If we were to translate the same into a cascade, it probably looks something like this, the population-based cascade, adolescent girls and young women, starting with the estimated population, going down all the way to those who remain um, negative. A different type of cascade we could prioritize is by population and product. And on the left, we have a, a, a theoretical cascade, again, for uh, sex workers in need of condoms. So we start with sex workers in need of condoms, all the way down to those who are able to use condoms and are accessing them. On the right side, we have a product-based cascade itself, the condom one. But the questions which we need to ask ourselves, and we have been asking, is we have insufficient data for many of the cascades. So how do we go about this? And most importantly, how do we model the estimate, the benefit of prevention? So how do we think cascades can be useful? They are actually going to revolutionize execution of HIV programming, and especially around forecasting and quantification systems and the expertise that is required. What product is required by whom? How many products? And look at, look, really looking at strengthening our commodity supply and management systems. A key issue is promoting uptake. Even if we have cascades, we really have to think about how we promote access and uptake of these interventions. So we need to have targeted HIV prevention and product literacy and investments in marketing prevention and actually leveraging on the different sectors that are within our local context. Back home, we have this famous saying, every young person, old person, literate, knows where to get a bumper 20. Bumper 20 is airtime for your phone. Why do they not know where to get a condom? So how do we leverage on other marketing uh, approaches, on other sectors, to actually get our products down to the individual level? Cascades can also be useful for our data systems in terms of m and &E. And really, when we have targets and indicators on prevention, everybody coalesces around that. We have uh, global indicators, but also at national level, we have come up with our own targets, which are in tandem with the 1990-90. Our data collection tools also would be strengthened in terms of reporting, community follow-up, and also adherence for uptake of these uh, interventions. And then most importantly, data capture and use at national and sub-national level and utilization of this data. So what are the final considerations? The first one, investments in cascades should cause minimum interruption to already existing health and other health sector, non-health sector data systems. How do we leverage on the non-health programs as a platform for HIV prevention delivery? And we need to consider data from other systems, for example, education or social services, especially when you're talking about adolescent girls and young women, and perhaps and not perhaps, probably uh, possible that we will not have a single cascade, but multiple cascades. And in Kenya, we want to pilot at scale our condom cascade, and we will be happy to be sharing with you the data very soon. Thank you very much. We have some time for a few questions. So maybe I, I, have, I have a question. So, so, so in your description of your cascades, you, you talked about the young women uh, perceiving their risk and then uh, using condoms. Do you think risk is a understanding risk and perceiving risk is a necessary step in the, the, the cascades and the programming? Do I think, sorry? Do, do you think perception of risk and understanding risk is a necessary step in in, prog in the cascade for the young women in Kenya and programming, or might it be that within the context of their, their lifestyles and sexual and reproductive health, you might be able to get them to use condoms or other prevention interventions without them perceiving their risk? No, we have to profile risk, and they have to perceive their risk. For us, that is the, actually the entry point of some of these prevention cascades with specific populations, if you're going to look at population-specific cascades. So risk profiling is important, and understanding of the risk is critical. Yes. I was just wondering about um, cascades for, young, for adolescent girls and young women. Um, and how you bring the men into the cascade, because for condom um, use, it's the man who's going to be using the condom. So I'm wondering if you have any kind of concept way of conceptualizing, um, is, it, uh, is it sort of uh, in thinking about a treatment cascade where you think about partial 
partial viral, you know, some reduction in viral suppression but not complete viral suppression, that there may be condom use with some partners but not other partners. Um, is there a way to, to integrate the men into the cascade for the, the adolescent girls and young women, or it, is it important for us to focus predominantly on the women? The resonating theme of the AIDS 2020 has been male engagement. So if we're really going to change how we're doing prevention, we have to bring the men in when we're talking about the cascades. So the theoretical cascade that I presented was around adolescent girls and young women, but their male partners and their male contacts have to be brought on board. So male engagement is key for the cascades to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. And that will hopefully drive up the the uh, the uptake. The, the out, yes. Yes. And the, the uptake output. and the outcomes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Christopher Acolo, who is an infectious disease physician currently with FHI 360 as the technical director for the PEPFAR USAID fo uh, funded global program targeting key populations called linkages. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, so this afternoon I'm going to be sharing with you uh, from a programmatic perspective what the cascade looks like for key populations. And the definition of key populations within the context of my presentation, sex workers, uh, men who are sex with men, people who inject drugs, and transgender persons. Uh, I'm going to provide a brief background, uh, just giving some information about you know, the approach that's currently being used to reach key populations across the, uh, the countries where linkages is currently being implemented. And of course, give you a brief overview of the service package for these key populations, and then provide some examples from a few countries where linkages is currently implementing, and keeping in mind that these are programmatic data, uh, essentially. And then using programmatic data to come up with some of the gaps and some of the challenges that are currently being faced across the cascade and how we design interventions and approaches for addressing some of these challenges across the cascade and then share some closing thoughts. This is the basic framework on which linkages is currently being implemented for all the four key population groups. And as you can see on the left side, I think that's on your, yeah, on the left side uh, is the prevention part of the cascade. And in order for you to be able to provide services to key populations, you need to understand the population, you need to know where they are, you need to know how many they are, you need to know what kind of services they want and what, how those services need to be delivered. So you can see that the first pillar is identifying the key populations and then reaching them with prevention services, ensuring that everyone you reach with prevention services eventually gets tested or know their status. And then those who are HIV negative have to continuously get re-engaged in this prevention side of the cascade so they can remain HIV negative by providing all the prevention packages, including PrEP, condom distribution, uh, lubricants, STI management, and all that, so that these individuals will remain HIV negative. And those who are positive are now moved across the other part of the cascade, enrollment in care, ART initiation, and eventually how to achieve value suppression. Underline these, is community engagement and capacity development, particularly of the local organizations of the CSOs that are implementing, particularly the prevention side of the cascade. Because in most countries, the prevention part of the cascade is currently being implemented by the CSOs and by the community. Now, within the services that are being provided for key populations, we need to keep in mind that we need to follow the differentiated service delivery model, keeping the key populations at the center of everything that we're doing in terms of where the services were provided, when the services were provided, what kind of services were provided, and by who. This is the basic, and this is at the center of all that we're doing. Otherwise, constructing a cascade, making sense of the cascade will become an issue. And just to give you an example of the service delivery model, because this is very important when you're constructing the cascade, because the kind of services you're providing and where those services are, being, are available will actually determine how and what your cascade will look like. And it's important to note that why the bulk of the community services are being provided by CSOs, non-governmental organizations, if by the time you are trying to construct the prevention side of the cascade, I think it's a little bit much easier because we have access 
to the population. We have access to the data that has been collected. However, when you move to the treatment side of the cascade, in most countries, services have been provided in the public sector. It becomes very challenging for key populations because of stigma, discrimination, and the lingual environment in those countries. It's very challenging for them to access services in public facilities. So when you're constructing the cascade, you get very good numbers from your prevention side. When you get to treatment side, it becomes a very challenging issue because you can no longer track these individuals across the other part of the cascade. So giving you some examples from a few countries, these are programmatic data on how we use or how we construct a cascade and how we use the cascade uh, to improve the program. This is from Angola and this is for MSM and transgender individuals. And you will see the, the, the bars in blue are the targets. Now, these are programmatic targets. But you can see that reaching key populations is not a major problem. Providing testing to them of the number of individuals that were reached, about 53% of them were provided with testing. Now, what is missing here is what proportion of these individuals are already HIV positive? What proportion of these individuals got tested shortly before they were reached by the program? And among those who were, uh, who were found positive, 50% of them were actually linked to care and treatment. Uh, no, sorry, 50% of those of the targets for that year has already been achieved, and 76% of those individuals who were reached and tested and found to be positive have now been linked to care and treatment. Uh, but if you're looking at quarter, quarter two specifically, about 72% of individuals that were reached have now been linked to care and treatment. Now, looking for sex workers in the DRC, the, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, again, reaching is not a major problem. Testing now is no longer a major problem because we have high uptake of testing among these sex workers. Case finding of 250 among over 4,000 individuals that were tested, linkage to care and treatment now is becoming less of an issue because of the service delivery model that is currently being used in our country, where the community service providers are now beginning to provide treatment within the community space. So it becomes easier for the key populations to also access and be linked to care and treatment. Now, not just looking at the number reached, number tested, but among those that were reached, disaggregating by the number of individuals that are actually supposed to get tested versus those who are already known to be HIV positive and those who actually decline testing. Because these are important information that will actually help you determine how your cascade looks like and how good your cascade uh, data is. Again, linkage to care and treatment among those who are found positive is not a major issue because of the model that's currently being used in that country. This is from Thailand, from the Thai Red Cross and the AIDS Research uh, Center. And I think this slide was also presented uh, a, a couple of days ago. Now, this is another way of presenting the cascade for key populations. Now, if you look at the bar in the center, received HIV testing, to the right of the bar, you are having the cascade for those who are HIV positive. So of the 155 individuals who are HIV positive, 92% of them have been linked uh, to care and treatment on ART, and 90% uh, of them who uh, of those who are due for HIV uh, viral testing are actually viral suppressed. And if you look at the left side of the cascade, for those over 1,000 individuals who are HIV negative, what proportion of them have been initiated on PrEP and what proportion actually uh, received PEP? This is another example from Swaziland, Eswatini, that's the name of the country, looking at PrEP cascade, particularly under the linkages project. And looking at the number of individuals who have been screened, now these are adolescent girls and young women, sex workers, MSM individuals, how many of them are at substantial risk of HIV accusation based on the risk assessment that was uh, applied? And how many were screened? How many eventually uh, were initiated on ART, or sorry, on PrEP? And from this, you will see that 63% of clients who were considered to be at substantial risk of HIV accusation were actually praised on PrEP. Again, depending on the model of service delivery that we are using, this is an example from AT where before ART was being provided at the community level, you will see that ART linkage, the rate was between 16 and 17%, 15 and 17%, very, very low because of the issues that we're all aware of, stigma and discrimination particularly. And now when the government allows us to start providing ART within the community space, 
this number actually improved. And you can see from 67% to about 93% at the end of Q4 of FY17. Now, this example is also from Thailand. Another way of presenting a cascade, prevention and care cascade for key populations, among those who were tested and found to be HIV positive, how many of them were initiated on treatment? And for those who were found to be HIV negative, how many of them have been initiated on PrEP? I'm going to skip this. Now, based on some of the, uh, the data presented and the cascades are presented, there are five key gaps that, were co that we continuously see, uh, particularly among key populations. How do we reach those who are considered to be at high risk of HIV acquisition? How do we do targeted testing, less testing, testing those who are likely to be HIV positive and ensuring we diagnose as many cases as possible. And how do we link them to care and treatment? How do we navigate across all the barriers, structural barriers that are currently being faced by key populations? How do we ensure that they are, initiate, they are immediately initiated on ART? We are beginning to see progress across a lot of countries because of tests and start that is now being implemented. And finally, the challenges of retaining key populations in care to ensure viral load suppression. Examples of some of the interventions that could be applied across the cascade to improve cascade results. Peer outreach, microplanning, peer navigation, using HIV positive key populations to actually navigate their, uh, their peers across the other part of the cascade. And importantly, how do we address stigma, particularly among healthcare uh, workers? Issues of violence prevention and response, very, very important. And how do we continuously engage the key population community to be at the forefront of implementation. Some closing thoughts. You need to know your target population. You need to understand the key populations that you are trying to provide services to. You need to know their needs. You need to know where they want the services to be provided. You need to know who they want the services uh, to be provided by. What are the program targets? Your targets to a great extent will determine how you implement and will determine how you actually interpret your cascade. What are the services that are being provided? If you're providing mainly prevention services and you are hacked to track people across the treatment cascade, there's a challenge there. So you may be successful in the prevention harm, but it becomes very challenging to track key populations across the treatment part of the cascade when you're not the one responsible for providing these services. Stigma and discrimination. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. I'm sure we're all aware. Safety and security issues. A lot of people have discussed this over the past couple of days and how they relate to key populations. Implementing partners, various partners implementing in countries. So sometimes your cascade is only based on the data you have and the access you have to data outside your program. So sometimes the cascade is not a true reflection of what is actually happening on the ground. Geographical coverage. Sometimes you're presenting cascade for key populations, but you're only working within one or two geographical areas in the country. So that may not be a good picture of what is happening at national level. Funding, 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 funding. We know the implication of funding on how you construct your cascade and how you use your cascade to improve your program. Now, whether you're providing services within the community or public health sector will also help you determine how your cascade looks like. And most importantly, the legal environment, the policies that are available in our countries, where we're implementing now, to a great extent, determine the cascade for key populations. I just want to say thank you to USAID PEFA, the linkages team across the 30 countries where we're currently implementing, and linkages strategy partners, intra health UNC, uh, uh, PACT, and of course, FHR 360. And to everyone who has contributed to this presentation, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And so we have a few minutes for questions, and I wonder if I can kick off. Um, so for your uh, cascades for Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the prevention side, it looked like the prevention intervention was testing. And is there anything that's offered in those populations uh, for the HIV negatives as there was in, in Thailand and, and some of the other places? Okay. Yeah, so like I, like I stated at the beginning, uh, we're implementing different programs in different countries. In Angola, we have a full prevention package. However, the slide I showed was mainly focusing on the number of individuals that were reached and number that were tested because this is a program. However, we're providing all the other services, but there's no prep. So STI services, condoms, and all that have been provided in Angola as well, but they were not included on the cascade. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
question. Hi, um, this is Pitch from the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Thank you again for that wonderful presentation. I think you and the two previous presentations talk about the importance of stigma and discrimination and how they are the driver of the gaps that we see. Yet we don't see um, the stigma and discrimination integrated into the cascade. Um, this morning I went to a session called Anti-Fragile. They talked about the interventions about the stigma and discrimination, but more importantly, how stigma can now be quantified. I think it is very important that we integrate stigma into the cascade and measure how the reduction um, of all of our interventions so that we can objectively know the progress on stigma and discrimination. Um, yeah, that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Even though I didn't present any data, at program level, uh, addressing stigma and discrimination is one of the main areas where we're you know, focusing, particularly among healthcare care workers. However, discussions are still ongoing in terms of how to present this. How do we, what kind of data do we collect? How do we reflect it on the cascade itself? But in terms of actual implementation and programming, this is integrated into the program, but in terms of how to monitor and how to report is something that we're still currently uh, uh, discussing, not just at program level, but I know at global level. How do we report on stigma? What is the impact of stigma reduction training uh, among healthcare workers on the cascade itself in terms of data? Yeah. Thank you. Peter? Thanks. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you, Hi. actually, to all the presenters. I'm Peter Aaron from the Gates Foundation. Um, my question actually is trying to link the last two presentations. Um, Chris, in your presentation, you put together a lot of nice data uh, about what looked actually like somewhat smaller numbers, a lot of things were in the hundreds. How would you take this information and link it to, and I'm not sure if linkage is in Kenya, but how do you influence national programs? What have you done? Can you talk one more about that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for, for that great um, question. Uh, I think the cascade slide I showed at the beginning of the presentation that shows community engagement, the community engagement also includes engagement with the government. So at national level, before implementation, all the services, all the approaches that we're planning to implement at country level, everything is passed by the government. So the government is involved at that level. Now, in terms of data, in most of the countries where linkages is currently implementing, linkages happens to be maybe the only one in some countries or one of the very few key population programs. So I have very good examples from Malawi where Almost data that's been presented at national level on key populations is coming directly from the program because we don't have many programs being implemented for key populations. So we sit at technical working groups at national level. We use data that we generate to help advocate for the needs and services that are provided to key populations. And we're beginning to have, including in Angola, where at the beginning of linkages, you couldn't even mention key populations on national level. Now the government is fully aware, the government is fully supportive. So we're beginning to use the data we generate to inform decisions even at national level. But we still have a long way to go in terms of all the structural issues that have been talked about. Thank you. Okay. Question at microphone number six. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Stephen Muldrum from the University of Michigan. Um, and my question is about uh, when you present the data on achieved viral suppression, how far did you actually take that out? Um, how far did that go? And this is connected to a broader question about the value of ex expanding this conceptual model of the cascade to include prevention as well as treatment because in the context where I work and I do ethnography with HIV practitioners in Atlanta, Georgia, I mean what we get a lot of our folks going through the cascade, achieving viral suppression, dropping out, and then in kind of these conceptual models that the epidemiologists build again, they kind of get looped back in at real linkage. But as you say, it's hard to follow up with these folks. But if it seems like um, there's been some problems in programs when, you know, okay, we've achieved viral suppression, we win, and then you kind of stop monitoring. But what really is the metric is when the cascade should sort of stop there, and they should remain virally suppressed forever. But we know that's not happening, even in, in many places in a majority of cases, particularly where infrastructure is not good. Um, so I'm, it's a two-part question. One, about how far did it out did you actually take that viral suppression data? How long did people remain virally suppressed? And then how does that affect the way that you're thinking about the prevention cascade model? Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, the data are presented based on program, program data. However, within the program, we have or additional services, particularly at community level, in terms of supporting adherence, 
and ensuring that we remind, peers remind key populations on treatment, whether they're very surprised or they're not very surprised, to ensure that they are retained and they continuously get re-engaged with the clinics. So we, I think one or two countries, uh, examples actually have another bar where you're talking about community support. So all the individuals who are HIV positive within the community are being supported by their peers, irrespective of their viral load status. However, those who are very surprised are also continuously supported. Those who are not very surprised are supported in terms of adherence and in terms of making sure they have access to the viral load. Now, in terms of the prevention, linking that to prevention, I don't have any data at the moment to show for that, but it's something that's very interesting that we can look at. But keep in mind again that this is at program level, not a study, not a research. So we're limited in terms of access to some of this information and some of the data. Like I presented, we only have full access to data that we generate ourselves because the vast majority of key populations in most countries are still supposed to access services from public facilities, where when they go there, they don't disclose as key populations, even though we have unique identifier codes to track them from the community, when they get to the clinical services, it becomes very difficult. So even when you show data on viral loads, sometimes the data you're showing is not a true picture because you have more people who are very surprised, but because you don't have access to their data at public facility level, then that affects the cascade that you're presenting. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next presentation is by Prafan Fanufak, who is the Professor of Medicine at Chula Longhorn University and the Director of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Centre in Thailand. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers in allowing me to share some of the interventions that we're doing in Thailand, which might fill the gap or enhance the cascade that we have been talking for the last uh, three speakers here. This is my disclosure. HIV testing is the entry point for prevention and care. So this is a most important step that we have to enhance. What I'm going to describe to you uh, today is uh, the, the model that we use in Thailand in, in, in uh, allowing or strengthening the key population lay providers to help in terms of HIV testing. If the test is negative, this well-trained key population lay providers also can enhance PEP uptake, which is uh, another important aspect of HIV prevention. For those who tested positive, same-day ART initiation is something that we can fill the gap of the treatment cascade. So these are three areas I'm going to describe to you in my next 15-20 uh, minutes. Key populations or community, they are very keen to reach the key to reach their friends. However, persuading their friends for HIV testing at the healthcare centers is difficult. That's why healthcare providers will come out in a, in a, in a, in a mobile clinic for HIV testing in a certain day, certain hours. This is better, but still cannot fit the, 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 the day and the hours that is convenient by the key population. So the community-based health services is, is, is good, but it's not yet perfect. That's why we need to have key, po key population themselves to provide services for their own friends. The services can be testing, can be provid uh, uh, providing uh, ART or PrEP. This approach is called key population-led health services, 
KPLHS, the terminology that is probably well known by everyone in this conference by now. KPLHS. This boutique key show the key elements that a well-trained key population lay providers can do in terms of reach, recruit, test them. If they're positive, they can be able to provide ART and retain them or prevent on, on, on treatment uh, cascade. For those who are test negative, this train key population lay providers and then can retain them in the prevention cascade, including HIV testing, repeat HIV testing, as well as PrEP and PEP. These are the uh, four provinces in Thailand with seven drop-in centers that Thai Red Cross Aid Center helped strengthening them about HIV services. These are the, the, the organizations that serve men having sex with men, male sex workers, transgender women, and transgender sex workers in the main provinces in Thailand. This project was supported by, US, by PEPFA through USAID and linkages since uh, 2015. In fact, the local hospitals and local public health offices provide continuing QA, QI, and mentoring. So this is a true governmental, non-governmental collaborations. This KPHS, KPLHS model can indeed perform a very good work. They could reach and test high-risk MSM and transgender, which is the main key driver of HIV epidemics in Thailand. For example, in, 19, in 2016, 42% of this group that have HIV testing throughout Thailand got their test from the seven drop-in centers in the KPLHS model. Whereas one-third of the newly diagnosed HIV infect infected person in this group also comes from this KPLHS model. If you don't have KPLHS model, you will miss a lot of infected persons in Thailand. This KPLHS model can really reach those high-risk people with a high prevalence and high incidence. For example, the prevalence among MSM is 18%. Among transgender women is 9%. When you look at the incidence, the incidence among these key populations is as high as 6 to 12%. Therefore, this KPLHS model is appropriate, it's the right uh, model to provide prevention to PrEP and PEP. In November 2015, a trans transgender health clinic has been established at the Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic, we call it Tangerine Clinic to the funding from PEPFA. For the two and a half years of operation, almost half of all the high-risk transgender women in Bangkok came to the services. We use hormonal services as a way to attract them to our center, our clinic, as well as to retain them in our clinic. As you can see, 91% of, of, of these transgender women had HIV testing, mostly at the first visit. You have seen this slide from, uh, from the previous speaker that the HIV prevalence among transgender women coming to our trans transgender clinic is 12%. As shown in this slide, 92% of these infected trans women can be put on ART with a nice viral load suppression at month six. So this is a very effective treatment cascade. However, when you look at the prevention cascade, that's the opposite. It's only around 10% of this negative 
high-risk transgender woman receive PrEP or PEP. Now let me turn your attention to the, to the treatment side. There are several reasons in Thailand that can result in delayed ART initiation. Even Thailand is a country that uh, adopt the treat all guidelines since 2014. And ART in Thailand is free of charge, but you have to go to a, a registered hospital. There are several reasons that there will be delay initiation, such as patient factors, as you can see, doctor's factor, or healthcare provider factors, or hospital factors, as well as health system factors, or maybe combination of several factors together. Let's take an example. So if someone walks in our Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic, TRCAC, which is a stand-alone BCT site, if they are tested positive, usually they will just recommend them to go to the hospital that, are, that they are registered with. Many people don't want to go because they are afraid to meet someone that they know over there. They don't want to go because the hospital is far away because the, 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 the province of birth may be different from where they are working. Or even they can go to those hospitals. The doctors may not start them with ART because they still have high CD4, they still look well. No, that's why we can skip the so-called linkage in care and retention in care before starting ART. Once you get HIV diagnosis, there's no reason at all to to, to, to retain them on, on care, to give them some vitamins for one more month or two months to see whether or not they are, uh, they are uh, co uh, uh, compliant with the, with, the, with the medication. You can put them on ART right away. So, uh, beginning at July last year, at our Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic, we started a same-day ART project using our clinic as an ART initiating hub. As I said, we are not providing ART, but we're just using it as an initiating hub. So anyone who's diagnosed in our clinic or being referred from our KPLHS centers in Bangkok will run, will, will, will take a, a fast-track laboratory evaluations and fast-track clinical evaluations. These are the laboratory tests that we will do on the same day of HIV diagnosis. But they don't need to know the results of the, of the lab test. If the patient is ready, as soon as we can exclude any tuberculosis or cryptococcal meningitis, and patients agree, we'll give them a two-week supply of free ART. If any abnormal lab results, we can call them back no, the next day or, or day later. On the follow-up visit at week two, if everything is all right, that means no side effects from medications, no abnormal laboratory tests, we'll then give them no more than two months supply of ART. No more than two months supply of ART. So during this two to ten weeks period, our navigator will work with the patient for warm transfer to their preferred permanent ART sites. Once a patient is started on ART, no hospital can deny continue the treatment for their registered patients in their own hospitals. So this is how the same day ART work can channel around some of obstacles that we, we face. For the last 10 months of, 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 of operation, we have more than 1,200 people diagnosed fit to the criteria of starting ART, agree for ART. As you can see there, 80% of, of these people can be put on same-day ART, another 10% within the two days, and all of them, all 100%, within three to seven days. The adherence is very good at three months, 
and also at six months, and also with 94% of viral suppression at six months. Now, let me turn to the prevention side, especially on PrEP. PrEP was recommended in the Thai treatment guidelines since October 2014. Two months later, at our anonymous clinic, we set up a fee-based PrEP. That means everyone who comes for asking for PrEP, they have to pay for. We call it PrEP 30, means 30 baht for one US dollars a day. A year later, January 2016, we set up this PEP supply at our KPLH site using the money donated by the, our Princess Som Savali. We call this project Princess PEP Program. As you can see, January last year, the government of Thailand also started a so-called PEP to start. Just a partially subsidized uh, uh, PEP service there. Just let me describe to you how we do it in terms of same-day PEP in our Princess PEP pro program, or even at our Red Cross here. So if anyone walks in and asks about PEP, besides the HIV testing, we also draw the same blood, the same tube of blood for creatinine and for hepatitis B surface antigens. If the test, the HIV test is negative, and the person still in, interested in having PrEP, then we will provide them with one month of PrEP supply on the same day that they ask for, 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 for PrEP. And the results of creatinine and hepatitis B surface antigen will be then informed to the patient the next day. So this is so-called the one day, the same day PrEP. For the last two and a half years, almost 2,500 MSM and transgenders that being given PrEP by the trained key population lay providers at the KPLH size. These are the ones who, 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 who advised and uh, uh, prescribed the uh, 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 TDFFTC to them according to the standard of procedure, to the standard uh, uh, procedures that we, we plan. Who are the high risk and what should be uh, done uh, with the person that will take PrEP? As you can see there, majority of people who fit the criteria of getting PrEP are either having multiple sex partners and in consistent common use. When you look at the overall PrEP program in Thailand, you can see three, three big dots here, a big, big group here. Almost you know, 8,000 people are on a PEP nowadays. You can see the first one is from the, a private clinic called Pulse Clinic. And then Princess PEP and also the PEP 30. All of this almost make up to 90% of all the PEP users in Thailand. Excluding those people who come for PrEP at the Pulse Clinic, which is mainly foreigners. PrEP in Thailand is very, very cheap, so many foreigners come to this private clinic to buy it. So that it leaves about 5,000 Thai PrEP users up to now. Out of 100,000 people who are in need, that means only 5% of PrEP supply. It's too slow, too much slow, to get any hurt effect, like the way that we are seeing from the New South Wales approach. You can see it when New South Wales starts the PrEP, the new infections among Australian-born MSM in Australia, in New South Wales, has decreased, except the foreign-born Australian in the red line. There are three main key players in any age, in any, in, in, in any country. These are policy makers, academia, and communities. Instead of concerted effort, sometimes dysfunctional collaboration can happen, which will then kind of blocking or pulling back the effort to reaching 
I think is. This can be academia. Most medical professionals to have too much ego, which then hampers any test shifting. At the same time, they are very conservative, always asking about randomized controlled trials, cost-effectiveness study. When you talk about policy makers, they have they put HIV/AIDS as a low priority, or they are too shy, too shy to talk about needle exchange, PrEP, PEP, or even test shifting. For community people, people living in HIV communities, they have somewhat reluctance in terms of PrEP, which is different from key population communities. They are very good PEP advocates. This is my last slide. KPLHS model is a, is a feasible and effective way to enhance uptake of early HIV testing, HIV treatment, and PrEP. We need to have enabling legal and financial environment in order to make this model sustainable. By doing so, you need to have open-mindedness of healthcare professionals and policy makers. They have to open their mind, like the way that the Vietnamese government is doing. Same day ART is feasible, although labor intensive, but worthy. PrEP needs to be scaled up rapidly and in a large scale to see any effect. All these simplification approaches, if implemented seriously, that's why my talk called serious Serious, serious simplifications, if implemented seriously, will fill the gap in the prevention and treatment cascade, leading to a real ending aids. All of us need serious and genuine interest and support from all stakeholders, especially policy makers and politicians, because they have to give us the money and the mandate that we have to do this. Because ending aids is a it is a mandate of the country, not for NGO or for any university like us. They have to have a sense of urgency, not business as usual. The earlier we can end as, the better we are. Thank you for your attention. We're going to be having a roundtable discussion, but if, there's one, if there are one or two questions uh, to begin with, George. Thank you, George Rutherford from the University of California in San Francisco. In your, when you start, uh, start people off and do the antibody testing, do you also do antigen testing routinely uh, to test people for incipient sero, uh, seroconversion? Uh, we use the fourth generation HIV tests. So do you have antigen testing as part of that? The, 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 the hepatitis surface antigen or what? No, no, H HIV antigen. HIV. So, so you were talking about in PrEP or in our uh, VCT clinic? No, in, in PrEP. When you're testing someone to put them on PrEP, do you also check for antigen to try and find the early seroconvertors? Uh, this is also a very good question. Now, right now, we are using uh, third generation uh, blood based uh, HIV testing. Mm -hmm. Although we start to use the, the, the new, the new uh, fourth generation uh, uh, HIV tests of uh, earlier combo, for example, we, we, feel, we find that it's, uh, it's, 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 it's much better, but it's not yet registered in Thailand. Yeah, okay, thank you. Great, there's a question here. Yeah, um, good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. Mukut from India. Um, as you were discussing about this 5% uh, of the population being on PrEP, and what I understand is that uh, Princess Prep, which has been donated by the princess. Uh, my only question is, how is Thailand going to sustain after the princess stops donating? <laughs> okay, very good question. Uh, you probably uh, saw the slide that you know, a busy slide of the prep. You know, the last call, last column that I did not mention about that. Uh, it was uh, it was planned. 
that by October this year, a PrEP will be provided free of charge under universal coverage program in Thailand just for MSM and transgender or maybe just in certain provinces here. However, this has not yet been finalized yet. That's why our representative from Minister of Public Health you know, cannot announce it publicly. But we hope that we'll try to use or whatever, or whatever effort that we have or, or push that we have to make that happen. Thank you, sir. One more question here. This one. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. This is uh, really interesting. It's also a connected question on sustainability. Even the national insurance program covers PrEP, but you still need uh, key populations to deliver it. And uh, are they volunteers or they are part of the NGOs? And how can this uh, funding sustain out of the formal system? I'm sorry, I cannot quite understand your question clearly. Please speak louder. Okay. So for the service delivery, for the PrEP, even if the medication is covered by national insurance, I believe your current model is k population led service delivery. Are they volunteers or they are coming from certain NGOs? Would the government be able to pay them for the service delivery? Talk about same day ART? Mm, I, I think no, it was just about in general. Prep, oh. prep, but it was the service delivery applied over the PrEP program. The, yeah, uh, the population. Okay, it's also a very good question here. I think for developing countries like many of us here, uh, the government support for NGO work or for CBO work is very minimal. Very minimal. So the sustainability. No, it's, it's a real serious question here. So uh, what we are trying to do now with, the, with, with another support from, from PEPFAR, we have a, a, a technical platform to uh, establish in order to, to, to train, to certify uh, this, keep, this uh, 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 well-trained key population uh, uh, workers to the point that they can be paid on, by, on service by the government. So this is something that we hope that we, 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 we would be able to push this policy because when we talk about uh, KPLHS, many people always think that this is something for the poor country. So being a Thailand, a Thai policy maker, you don't, don't say that you are poor. But we have to say this community participation in, 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 in healthcare is universal, for even for the rich country. You know, uh, a couple of days ago, someone came to talk to Dr. Nitya that probably the uh, uh, young black MSM in U.S. also probably need the same kind of KPLHS approach. Okay, so once you say, you no, know, this is something that needed, not just for HIV, for diabetes, for hypertension, whatever, this is a good way to get people in a, in a good health. So and then we we'll go, can uh, good get uh, financial support. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So if people have questions for the panel, uh, please come up. And um, I just wanted to circle back to the question about um, duration and uh, how time fits into the cascade. And in particular, there's this critical piece of, of retention. People both get lost from programs, but also they just uh, drop out of care. How do you integrate retention into the cascades that you've been talking about? Is anybody that just for anyone on the panel who'd like to speak to that issue? Sorry, I thought it was directed to David. Okay. So the, your your question is about integration Ret retention. Right. So not just viral suppression at one time point, but how do you look at sustained viral suppression over time? And it, similarly, I think if you you can set targets for prep starts, which is what many do, but then people don't stay on it. They're, the average retention is less than six months, and so uh, it can drive just a lot of starts, but you're not actually maintaining people. Um, so, what do we do to integrate retention into this care, into the care and prevention cascades? Okay, so, uh, I think for the for the prevention cascade and speaking specifically about PrEP, uh, the way PrEP retention is currently being defined, I think is something that needs to be revisited. 
And I said that because, for example, the fact that someone is starting PrEP today does not mean the individual is going to be on PrEP for the next six months. So looking at the reasons why people are on PrEP at the beginning and then looking at retention in relation to why individuals are on PrEP. So because the way we currently uh, present the cascade for, for PrEP, you have a 1,000 individuals who initiated PrEP six months ago, and now you're looking at what proportion of them are still retained without keeping in mind some of the reasons why people drop out and not necessarily looking at these individuals as being lost, but rather they actually discontinue PrEP because they only need their PrEP for a certain period of time. Uh, so I don't have a clear, it's a straightforward answer for that. For, for, for treatment, uh, I'm speaking again from a programmatic perspective because most of the programs that we implement are time bound. So even when you integrate uh, retention, you can only look at retention within the period, within the time frame of the program that you're implementing. At the end of that, it becomes very difficult. It's challenging for us because we are PFAS supported and we look at things on a yearly basis, for example. So you're looking at individuals who have been retained on treatment for 12 months, and at the beginning of the next year, you're starting all over again. But we're now beginning to put systems in place such that we're looking at retention all through the program, whether somebody has been on treatment for the past two years and still in the program, how do we define and how do we ensure that such individuals continuously get retained? And like I stated, particularly for key populations, retention is beyond clinical services, particularly for key populations. The bulk of retention has to do with the services that have been provided at the community level, and these services have been provided by the peers. So you come into the facility now that we're talking about differentiated service delivery, we're talking about multi-month scripting, people are going to be coming to receive ERT once in six months or once every six months, but the bulk of the work is done at community level. How do we ensure that in the next six months this same individual makes it back to the facility to take ERT? This is done at community level. So we need a lot of, we need to think about a lot of things. It's not very straightforward to just look at, oh, well, let's look at retention at the end of one year, at the end of two years. But do we have all the systems in place to ensure that these individuals are actually retain in order for us to get the numbers that we're interested in? Thanks. I see an opportunity for us to strengthen community systems and peer-to-peer -peer networks, because there are very many factors that affect adherence and retention outside the health facility. So even as we think about the cascades, we have to think about the linkages between the community structures, community systems, and the health structures. So I think it's an opportune time for us to begin having that discussion. So, so maybe, you know, just from a sort of measurement perspective, yes. <coughs> um, I mean, I, I suppose what I think is, you know, they, these are important issues, right? The, there are these two kind of ways of thinking about the cascade. We most commonly see these cross-sectional cascades, and that tells you something, right? They're a representative snapshot of what yeah. the situation is at a point in time. And then there's another way of thinking about the, the same phenomenon, which is the continuum of care, whether that's in relation to treatment or uh, prevention, over time. And you can see that in routine data systems. And, and there, absolutely, you need to recognize that people come into it. Their needs change over time, their position on the cascade over time, and your response as a provider will change over time in response to that. So, so I feel like the, the two things are complementary pieces of information. You, you definitely need to interpret cross-sectional cascades cognizant of the fact that there are people who aren't there. And you, you need to think about the longitudinal data and recognizing that people pass into and out of these, these states. Right, and I, I think sometimes the retention comes before, in a cascade, comes before the viral suppression, and it just means that they've been tested. But I'm wondering if we need to add a piece at the end, which is everything is kind of cross-sectional until the end, but persistent viral suppression would be a very nice measure to have. Indeed. Um, yeah, so, so I think, I mean, it's, it's a really important point. You can uh, look at uh, how long people are, are successfully virally suppressed, and I think that there is a difference, though, between the treatment and the prevention in the sense that, that for treatment you need to be virally suppressed for life. In terms of prevention, your prevention, you're stopping yourself from acquiring HIV may be a temporary thing. So we've got to try and work out how long that list, risk lasts when we're measuring whether people are on PrEP. There's no point in people taking PrEP if they have no exposure to HIV. I, uh, I think the KPOHS uh, model is you know, by using being friends, brothers, okay, with that love and tender 
I think they are in a very good position to get their friends to come back for viral load testing, for AIV treatment, but not very good yet at this point for PEP continuation. We have to do better on that one. Right, and, and getting some kind of qualitative data to find out why people drop off of PrEP so that because only a certain proportion is it that they think that they're no longer at risk. And so we have a question here. Hi, uh, Robin Schaefer from Imperial College London. Um, thank you, everyone, for providing very nice examples of how a prevention cascade can look like in reality. Um, however, uh, if we look beyond this session in this conference or more broadly in the literature, I think prevention cascade feature not very strongly. Uh, hopefully, it's not just me missing out on all the prevention cascade. So, um, why do you think that is? Maybe is it, oh, if it's not just me missing out, is it maybe that prevention cascade as a concept are not as great as we think it is? Or if it's a great concept, what kind of barriers there are there for policymakers, program planners to use this concept in the field? So I don't mind having a go at that. Thanks, Robin. Um, so I mean, I, I don't think you're missing loads of stuff in the literature. I don't, um, or, and I mean, even across the panel today, I think we're using that terminology prevention cascade in quite different ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that the truth is that that idea is still kind of bubbling around and being, you know, thought about by people. And, you know, I, sp I suppose my overall, you know, my, the, 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 the model that I presented, the, the, the thing that I think that it does uh, explicitly is tries to, l to try to bring in an assessment of what people's needs are. You know, that the, it tries to recognize that there are potentially different barriers, different blocks to why people are not able to avoid or are preventing HIV infection. And it recognizes that there are things that are to do with demand, things that are to do with supply, and things to do with capability to actually uh, enact a prevention behavior. And I think some of the other cascades that were presented are, are a, a, a bit more focused on the supply side and trying to keep people with it, retain people within care. And that's an important component of it. And we're still kind of working out how, you know, how to go about uh, measuring, but also kind of agreeing on what the important formulation of this thing is. And I, I suppose the, you know, the, the one thing I would say is the measurement challenges, as I said earlier, I don't have the answers to all of them. They are profound, I think, for some of these things. But just as we're learning about the treatment cascade, you know, the great questions about sustained viral load or these processes of people coming into it. You know, what the treatment cascade has done, I think, is get people thinking about what the steps are and what you could do about them, whether that's through qualitative work or thinking about different cascades. And, you know, I suppose my underlying position is that I think we need that for prevention. And PrEP's a good example. I, I see around the conference lots of demonstration projects with PrEP with really radical differences in uptake, in retention, and we need to understand what's going on. You know, it's, surely it's the case that the, the, what's going on in those programs is different in each place. And the, the cascade idea is really just there to help programs think about um, how to respond. It's a framework for thinking about it. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the excellent presentations. My name is Maria Carrasco, and I'm uh, from the United States, uh, USAID. My question is about um, whether you guys have considered uh, the number of infections averted uh, in your cascades or how that has factored into your thinking and uh, whether you know or recommend of any good tools one could use to think about that. Because it, it seems a bit to me that that's a bit of a missing piece in terms of the prevention work to try to, you know, bring to bear, you know, what is the impact of the work that, uh, of the work that we're doing in prevention? Thank you. So, uh, I, I thought you were going to respond to that because that has to do with measurement. Uh, currently within, within the program, we don't have any tools uh, that we're using to actually look at the number of infections that are there, but it's, it's, a, it's a very great suggestion, and I know people are beginning to talk about it. But I think it also depends so much on the kind of program you're implementing, you know, who your donors are, what are some of the priorities of your donor, you know, and I know that globally now a lot of attention is being placed on, you know, ART, you know, diagnose people, put them on treatment. So and I think that's one of the reasons why it appears the prevention part of the cascade, prevention cascade is not, you know, uh, attracting the kind of attention that you attract because globally, you know, we're trying to meet the 1990, 90, 
forgetting the fact that you cannot meet the 1990-90 without the prevention part of the cascade as well. So I think it's a very important point, and I think probably some people will, you know, will make more sense out of that if you're able to demonstrate and show them that through your prevention uh, packages, this is the number of infections that are currently averting, maybe to make more sense, and that can also drive the donors again to see, okay, yeah, if this is actually making a lot of impact, maybe we can invest more on in that. But I think currently we need to look at how not to separate prevention from treatment and not think that, oh, prevention is separate, and therefore all the packages and all the services are provided have to be different from what we're providing for treatment. So both of them are supposed to be going together because, of course, we know that when you are treating people, we are also preventing again. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I think I agree with you entirely, and I think personally that we can estimate the number of infections that we're averting through using these cascades. We, we've actually run out of time, but if you can be very, very quick, could you, last question over there? Uh, sure. Um, this is Stephen Moldrum again from the U.S. I don't know if there's a quick uh, uh, way, way to ask or answer well, this question. However, um, I will do my best. Uh, so, you know, what I... Uh, what, what my, one of my enduring frustrations in uh, just working in the HIV AIDS world in general, in general is that we get these new frameworks or you know fixes to uh, problems of prevention and care, um, such as you know the cascade or continuum model that um, says that. Uh, you know, issues in remaining in care or getting in care are due to problems with things like, you know, st stigma and discrimination or, you know, not having the adequate models to mobilize the resources that we need to get people in care when, in fact, oftentimes the difficulty of getting people into care uh, is not just about stigma and discrimination or is not just about uh, access to health care, but a more generalized social problem, such as lack of access to housing, period. Or, you know, if you think about all of the programmatic folks who are employed in the, on the prevention side of the, the cascade, those actually not being jobs that, uh, c that are good paying jobs where you can get skilled people in those roles to really provide the necessary support services to support this cascade. And, uh, and, and I'm wondering if you've thought about how to build that into your cascade models or how we can kind of try and think in a more broader, not just biomedical way about the social causes of um, not being able to hit the, car the targets that our cascades are designed to hit. I think I understand the question. And if you look at what James's uh, video, you'll see that he talked about that distinction between biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions. And, and it's the structural interventions that I think you're talking about. And I think what we have to remember with these cascades is that they're a description of what's happening in the population, but they're not a description of the causes. And we need to think about the causes of why there are gaps in the cascade, which I think is, is exactly what you're talking about, is, is how structural barriers to people being in care or, or acquiring the tools for HIV prevention uh, are very uh, important. So that's, that's actually a great, great question to, to end this, this panel. And uh, as we've run out of time, uh, we are going to have to, to finish up. Uh, I'll just say that I think uh, some, of, some of these issues that we're, we're grappling with, we are starting to come with some, some answers, and we're hoping UNAIDS will produce some guidance in, in the fall about some of the, these, these questions about how we use prevention cascades. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to thank my, my co-chair and my, my fellow panelists for, for a great session. Thank you very much. Thank you.